and I wanted to figure out how do we get this stuff back into the way that teams work without seeming like that horrible dictator style architect that people don't like. Yeah, so basically it seems the answer to that question is uh, you should do just enough upfront. Yeah. Just the right amount. That's the, a very right. easy answer. You just do the Which right sounds obvious, of- isn't it? But it's, it's like super hard to quantify. <laughs> but nobody ever looks at that. Right. This episode was made possible thanks to Gotopia.tech. So, welcome Simon, it's great to talk to you. You know, I enjoy that anyway, but in fact, using it for dual purposes, you know, actually triple purposes, in fact, I'm, I'm getting a nice conversation and I also get an audio track for the Case Podcast and we get a video track for the Go to Book Club. This is just, just about perfect. So, Simon, why don't you start by telling everyone who you actually are and what you do for a living? So I'm an independent consultant, mostly specializing in software architecture. Uh, So my background is as a a software developer, building software either for or with uh, customers. I used to work in a consulting environment. Now I get to do two things. I get to hopefully one day again, fly around the world and run architecture workshops. And I also have another company called Structurizer, which is a, it's a set of tooling to help people create software architecture diagrams essentially. So that's me. Very cool. Okay, so um, I, as I'm a software architect myself, I will, you know, try to just ask questions, but I'm very sure I'm going to, you know, just have to agree or disagree, most likely agree with some of the things you say. So let's just start and, and discuss a few things. So maybe first of all, um, the tools and the books, which we're going to talk about as well, uh, they all sort of seem to make a point of making their target audience developers. It's as if you want to draw attention to the fact that architecture matters to developers, should matter to developers as well. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Why do you think that is, or why do you think people could think that it's not important for developers to consider architecture? So the whole software architecture for developers thing really came about, so when I worked for consulting uh, companies, in order to scale and grow a consulting company, you need more teams to go service more customers. And for every t- for every extra team you need, you need more tech leads, more architects. And so basically a lot of this stuff came from me teaching our developers how to, to think about software architecture, to do software architecture, to communicate software architecture. And when I was going through this myself early on in my career, I didn't really find the existing literature helpful in terms of I'm a developer now and I've been thrown into an architecture role, what do I need to do? There were lots of books out at the time, you've got all the SEI in practice books um, and so on and so forth, but I just found they were very research based and academic focused and it didn't really give me a, if you're an architect, this is the sort of stuff you should do. So that's really where my focus uh, came from and, and hence the kind of software architecture for developers theme. And to kind of answer that same question from another angle, I guess, when the Agile Manifesto came around in the early 2000s, we saw lots of people jumping on that, which is great, and there's a lot of benefit coming out of the Agile movement. However, a lot of people started dropping some of the more design-focused, documentation-focused, architecture-focused techniques and practices and processes. And I wanted to figure out How do we get this stuff back into the way that teams work without seeming like that horrible dictator style architect that people don't like? And also I want to reintroduce some of the existing ways of working, but with a little bit more of a developer focus so that developers potentially pay more attention to them, if that makes sense. So Mm -hmm. that's really the kind of developer focus, I guess. Mm -hmm. So do you think architect should be a role or is it simply a set of tasks that people that somebody just has to do? Kind of both, I guess. Um, if you look back like 15, 20 plus years, every team would probably have an architect on the team who would do all of that stuff and they would really get involved in the code and they would tell people what to do and, and we learned that that's not a fantastic way to work. Those tasks still need to be done but perhaps nowadays with our more modern agile approaches they're much more collaborative uh, you know trust is an inherent factor in many teams maybe we don't need that single person who's who's looking after all of those tasks 
And that's why I like to think about it as a role. So it is a role that the collective team needs to do. It doesn't need to be one person. It could be many people. But yeah, that 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 set of tasks does still need to be done in order to, you know, hopefully get a better, more successful end result. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I completely agree with that with that assessment. Um, I mean, after all, if you don't, you sort of have to do it because otherwise what you end up with will be will just be a matter of, you know, whatever happened to you, right? It'll be sort of accidental because some people made decisions and you just end up with some sort of architecture that may or may right. not be what you wanted. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's either the kind of accidental structure thing, so big ball mud, or some of the quality attributes tend to get forgotten about because they kind of fall between the gaps between the people like performance and security and, and scaling. Yeah. It's like, oh, I thought someone else was looking after that stuff, but oh no, it's, it, it's our job collectively. Yeah, I've, al- I've also seen people uh, build something that works perfectly well in some architectural dimension. Um, the problem was just that that dimension was not one anybody really cared about. I mean, not, nobody wanted that system to be that super scalable. It just, you know, but it was a lot of fun to make it like that. I mean, I can't say that I've seen too many systems that were too scalable. I mean, that would be a bit of a um, bit of an exager- exaggeration as well. But right, of course, as you mentioned, the quality attributes are something that you need to take into account to make a decision what actually matches those requirements. And yeah. so you have to know them up first and then people right. often actually don't. Yeah, completely agree. Um, so you mentioned the you mentioned the uh, the Agile Manifesto as a sort of an influence, sort of something that let some people, uh, I, I think we both agree, mistakenly to dismiss all of the architectural uh, ideas and all of those all of those things but um i think some of the react some of the reasons for that were that it was all all very often at least um associated with uh, doing a lot of work up front um uh, you know like having this you know somebody somebody designs the system builds the architecture in the form of a lot of diagrams and pros and big documents and then just you know hands it off to somebody else to actually build it according to those guidelines and decisions and rules that are in the big architectural uh, master document. Um, so uh, I think pretty obviously that is not a good way to build things, but um, maybe the, the other extreme isn't that great as well. So, so how much architectural work needs to be done before you actually start coding? Yeah, there's a, a great quote by Dave Thomas. He says that big design up front is dumb and doing no design up front is even dumber. And it, it's that kind of flip-flop from one extreme to the other, which is exactly what I've seen teams do over the past, uh, what, 20 years now. So, yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Doing too much kind of locks you down. It's too rigid. You spend lots of time getting there. You spend lots of time potentially solving problems you're never going to have. Then you have to kind of audit and, and make sure all of the people are doing all of the things according to the document you wrote four years ago, which, uh, you know, and the world's moved on. And... I think a lot of people misinterpreted the Agile Manifesto and because the Agile Manifesto doesn't explicitly talk about doing upfront design, a lot of people, I think, have interpreted that as the Agile Manifesto says don't do upfront design. And if if you read things like extreme programming and if you read some of the principles, it is easy to kind of get that view of what the Agile Manifesto is saying, but I don't think that's the case. What I find amusing about all this is when I worked for consulting companies back in the early 2000s and the Android Manifesto was kind of coming out, I looked at it and, and I thought, well, that's kind of what we're doing anyway. You know, I was very hesitant in doing the big upfront design because I knew that, well, first of all, it's really boring. I, 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 I did work on a few projects prior to that where we do like six months of just doing design and using rational rows and putting UML diagrams into rows. And it was it was very interesting from a kind of domain analysis perspective, but we wrote zero code, and I just got bored of doing that. So that was never really my uh, approach anyway. So my approach was kind of well, let's get the big building blocks in place. Let let's understand the major driving factors, the major important uh, quality attributes like security and performance, and and so on. And then let's kind of build a, a design around that, and then we'll fill in the blanks as we go along. So when the Agile Manifesto came in, and I was, I was thinking, well. That's what I do anyway. So from my perspective, nothing changed too much. But I, I guess depending on where you were coming from at the time, your perspective was very, very different. And I think that's what led a lot of teams down the no design route. Uh, and unfortunately, in some cases, fortunately, in others, of course, 
those same teams are now realizing that was potentially a bad idea. And they're now starting to go back and think about, well, what sort of design should we do up front? How much should we do? And what sort of uh, architecture process should we put around making sure that people are doing the things we think they're doing to fit into the constraints of the environment and the guidelines and principles and everything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically it seems the answer to that question is uh, you should do just enough up front. Yeah. Just the right amount. That's the, a very right. easy answer. You just do the Which right sounds obvious, isn't it? But it's, it's like super hard to quantify. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, but I think we, we agree on that as well. So uh, there was an interesting interesting uh, thing that you just mentioned, which is this impression that sometimes when you read a book um, or, you know, some sort of paper or, or some, some blog post or whatever, you look at it and say, well, so that all sounds totally obvious. And I mean, that's what we're doing anyway. So why is everybody making such a, such a big fuss about the whole thing? But I've, I've come to, to sort of think that that, in some cases at least, is the sign that this is a very great contribution, a very valuable contribution, because it actually you know, articulates something that's, that should be obvious and maybe is obvious to you as a reader, but actually may not be. So to be perfectly honest, I had some of that feelings when I first read your book, right? Because I was like, this, 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 that's one of the reasons I said we'll probably agree, right? I, I, this, this all seems very reasonable. It seems so reasonable that I keep saying, well, yeah, sh sh duh. I mean, <laughs> sure, <laughs> yeah. that's what you should be doing. But I still think there are excellent books and your contributions are great because they actually provide a lot of value to people who, who may not have that experience, who may not have arrived at those conclusions and they, they get it in a form that actually makes it tangible and you know gives them some actual guidelines of doing things. So that's, I think, um, I think what I'm trying to say is that um, if you if you read a book or, or if you if you're looking at something and it seems uh, c kind of like what you're doing anyway, that's not a not a sufficient reason to dismiss it. It may be an yeah. excellent thing, yeah. just what you need to convince other other people. Yeah, and, and and of course there are lots of people now entering the industry, and they didn't see the stuff that predated exactly. the Agile Manifesto, yes. Yes. so they they kind of missed that whole journey, and now they're just getting the end bit where it's. We move fast, we break things, we don't do design. And like, hang on a second, that's that's yeah. not what's happening here. We should maybe step back and and, and plug some of the gaps that uh, these people don't have in terms of knowledge and, and experience. Yeah, good point. Um, so uh, one of the things that you emphasize a lot is uh, the role of visuals, right? The role of diagrams, the visualizing architecture. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Why is it not enough to just, you know, sketch something on a whiteboard somewhere and, and then wipe it away 30 seconds later? So that, that's one of the, that, that is one of the big things that the Agile Manifesto and the Agile movement has trended teams towards. It's the, you don't need these big design documents. You don't need to do these big, um, heavy upfront design processes and you don't need to use expensive tooling. Grab a few people draw some sketches on the whiteboard, have that conversation, and then erase it. And the emphasis here is the values in the conversation. And I completely agree, you know, if we've got a bunch of people around a whiteboard and we're, we're talking about different ideas and different designs and different approaches, and we're assessing trade-offs and stuff, that's a super, super valuable conversation and we should definitely keep having those things. The problem I've seen is that once people erase these diagrams, a lot of that knowledge gets lost. Now, sometimes people take a photo and they stick on Confluence and, and that's all good, but- Nobody ever looks at that. Right. Nobody looks at it because nobody can find it, first of all, <laughs> uh, because the architect who, who uh, drew it quit three years ago or something. If the diagram doesn't make sense from a visual perspective, it's very easy to interpret what you think the diagram means, and that might be completely different to what everybody else thinks. So. I'm a fan of whiteboards and I definitely recommend teams use whiteboards for doing upfront design. I just want people to add a little bit more, and I have to be careful how I phrase this, formality mm -hmm. and structure around what they're drawing because it's far too easy to draw two boxes on a whiteboard, stick an arrow between them and that can literally mean anything. And I want the stuff that we're drawing to have a little bit more meaning. Now, of course, you might ask, well, why don't we just use UML? And that's a very good question. And up until sort of 2004, 2005, I was a big UML user. 
So all of the documentation I did, all the sketching I did was using UML. But it went out of fashion and, and people dropped it like a hot potato in sort of the mid 2000-ish uh, uh, to, to uh, 2010 years. And it's not really bounced back. You know, when I go and see teams and I say, you know, what sort of notations are you using to draw your architecture? They, they literally just say boxes and lines on a whiteboard. There's no mention of UML. Some of the people who have now been through university and college and their apprenticeships, they're not being taught to UML. So again, you, you, you have a whole bunch of people in the industry who have missed out on all that stuff. And they just think, well, let's draw some random boxes and lines because that's what everybody else does. And to get back to your question, I think, uh, and I hope, I think visuals are super, super important. I think you can literally hang all of the other stuff related to the architecture role around a good set of visuals because that good set of visuals allows you to tell stories. It allows you to have design discussions. You can make design decisions. You can assess trade-offs. And it just opens up all of that information to a much, much wider audience. So, so that's why I place so much importance on the visuals. So do you think, because everybody's now working remotely, these days, do you think um, things have changed because tools are more important and the things that we create just, you know, are more structured because the tools typically offer some structure uh, as a default? I think, and especially if you look at remote working and especially with the whole pandemic thing, what teams have done, and I, I've definitely seen this, they've taken their whiteboards in the office because they're not allowed in the office anymore and they're using tools like Miro because they can basically fire these things up. You can get a bunch of people looking at them. You can all interact and collaborate at once. And, and, and Miro is a fantastic tool, and I'll, I'll certainly use it myself um, for other things, but it's not going to give you structure. So if you approach a whiteboard, it's not going to provide you any assistance in drawing an architecture diagram. It's, it's not going to help you explain what types of abstractions you should be drawing and, and you know the, the semantics of the visual language you're using. Miro is the same. Um, it's just a great way to draw boxes and arrows collaboratively. It's, it's, a, it's a collaborative online whiteboard. So I think we're missing a trick with tooling here. I, I think, and again, I have to be careful what I say here because it's very easy to interpret what I'm saying is we should go back to doing what we did 20 years ago with rational rows and have lots of rules and semantics and it was all very, very precise. And maybe that's too far. So maybe we need to kind of rein that back a bit but have some tooling that actually provides some assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same with like AutoCAD. Now, if you want to sketch out a, a set of building blueprints, you don't fire Visio up. Visio is going to offer you no assistance at all, apart from you've got this box and this box, and you can put them together and group them. You, you're going to use something like AutoCAD because it's going to provide you assistance and rules and, and uh, different things like that. So, I, yeah, I think there's still some more work to be done there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what people might be missing is that... Um the assumption somehow seems to be that if you use something like UML or any sort of structured case tool, whatever you know, whatever it happens to be, then uh, in the end you'll uh, you might have to specify things at at a level that is very close to programming, right? So people fear that they have to go into all of the details and you know provide all of the fulfill all of the requirements of something that could then be automatically turned into code, which is not something that you have to do. I mean, you could possibly do that, or whether it's a good idea or not probably beyond our scope today, but um, even though you could do that, you can just as well use a tool like that to model something mm. at a very high level, right? Just draw the, the high level structure of your system um, just with a little bit more meaning, uh, more semantics as to this is what this kind of line means, right? If it's a dashed line, it means something different than a solid line because that's why we make it a dashed and not a solid line. So right. whatever that, I mean, you could invent your own notation. Yeah, yeah, um, totally and then stick to it, that would be perfectly fine. But you could also yeah. use one of the notations that's already there. For example, right. UML, which of course gives you a ton of variation and lots of ways to customize it. And because it's a super powerful, super customizable tool may end up being super complex and way too powerful for what you want to do, as usual. And then you might yeah. end up with alternatives, which I'm sure we're going to talk about very soon. So yeah. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming go to conference using the promo code book club visit gotopia.tech to learn more